Good morning, New Branch family. It is good to gather together for worship again this morning. Uh, we are thankful that we've been able these last few weeks, or several weeks now, uh, to gather together digitally and worship that the Lord has allowed us to do that. We're longing to be together again physically, uh, but we are thankful that we've had this privilege to continue to worship at least in this way. And so if you're visiting with us, we're so thankful and glad that you have joined us this morning. And we are looking forward to praising the Lord, to worshiping the Lord, to exalting Christ uh, this morning as a church family. So as we begin our time of worship, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless it and to use it for his purposes, his glory for our good. Pray with me. Father, we are thankful that we have the privilege to gather this morning. It is indeed a privilege. You have gathered us as your people. You have called us out of darkness and into light by the work of your Son on our behalf. We're thankful for his life, his atoning death, and his victorious resurrection. Father, we're thankful that he is at your hand right now, interceding on our behalf, praying for us as we gather for worship, and we're thankful that he will soon return and gather us to himself. So as we gather this morning, as we worship, as we begin this time, we confess, Father, that we need your help. That just as we saw last week in your word, that we can go through all the motions, we can do all the things of worship together this morning, but if you do not bless it, it is all in vain. And so this morning, Lord, we are asking that you would bless this time and that you would use it. We lament that we're not together physically, but Father, we are thankful that we've had the privilege and had the ability over these last six to eight weeks to gather together, at least digitally, and to still be encouraged to know that we're singing songs and praises together at the same time, to, to hear your word preached and to be uh, to pray together and to be encouraged and so father we're thankful for that we're confessing that we need your help and we ask that you would um, focus our attention and our minds although we're gathered in our homes and there's so many distractions that could easily distract us focus our minds and attention uh, although our atmosphere and circumstances around us may be somewhat casual let not our attitudes be casual but Father, let us engage as we worship this morning through song. Let us engage as we hear the word read uh, this morning. And then as we hear the word ex exposited and preached this morning. So Father, I pray that you would, our heart posture would be uh, one of seriousness and, and thankfulness as we worship you and as we give our attention to you. Lord, we ask that you would be at work through this time, that you would use uh, the songs and that you would use the prayers and the word, that you would use the means of grace this morning to, um, to give us the very encouragement that we need, to give us the very rebuke that we need, the very correction we need. Father, to, uh, to spur us along, to not grow weary in doing good. And Father, to sanctify us, to make us look more like Jesus as a result of worshiping. We pray for those who are visiting with us. Some know you through Christ and we rejoice in that. Father, we pray they're encouraged. Some don't know you. And Lord, we pray that even this morning through a digital worship service that you would use this time to call lost sinners to faith and repentance, to call them to yourself and to make them your children. So Lord, we're praying for salvation this morning. We pray above all and that everything that happens, that you, our Father in heaven, are glorified, that Christ is exalted, and that your spirit would be at work powerfully among us. And Lord, we long to be together soon. We pray toward that and ask that, that you would allow that. And uh, Father, that the circumstances would uh, turn in uh, into that, that direction, allowing that, bringing that about. We pray for those who are sick. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon them, healing and restoration. And Father, we pray uh, for all the saints during this season uh, that you would keep us encouraged, that you would keep us focused, and that we continue to strive uh, by your grace uh, to serve you for your glory and those around us. So use this time of worship towards those ends, and we are thankful for it. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. It is good again to worship our risen Savior together this morning, even though we do so remotely from our homes. Uh, hopefully soon we will be together again uh, in person to encourage one another. Uh, nevertheless, we are encouraged by God's word that we're going to hear read and preached, and we're going to sing uh, and exalt our risen Savior together this morning. 
We'll get things started this morning with Todd Dale. He's going to read um, scripture for us from Psalm 86 for our call to worship. Good morning, New Branch family. I'm Todd Dale, and I will be reading from Psalm 86, verses 8 through 13. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of shale. This is the word of the Lord. Well, church, now let us uh, let's lift our voice and sing to our holy God. Sing holy forever. Uh. 
Let's sing that chorus one more time. Come and behold him. Sing holy forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Let's sing this hymn together. Holy, holy. We're going to continue to worship now with a reading from Philippians chapter 3. And Earl Turner has that reading for us this morning. There's a reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. 
to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I may have already obtained this, or I am ready, already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Church, let's continue now to worship as we sing together this song, All I Have is Christ.
could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be my own. Jesus is my life, hallelujah, and all I have is Christ, and hallelujah, and Jesus is Sing that chorus one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy, holy. There is no one like you. There is no Sing Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing, I will build my life. And I 
Yes, Father, we, this morning we do choose to build our lives upon the love that you have demonstrated for us so clearly in sending your son for us. Jesus, in the love that you displayed by giving your life for us at the cross, being raised for our justification, giving us the precious gift of your Holy Spirit to indwell us and to be the seal of our redemption. And we thank you so much, Father, that your love can be trusted, that we can put our whole life into your hands and know that, God, you have us. This whole world and everything in it, God, is under your sovereign control, under your sovereign authority. And God, we know that in all things you are working for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. We take great comfort in that, God, that you are uh, working for us, that you're not against us. Even in what's going on in our world right now, God, you are bringing about good in our lives, sanctification, holiness, drawing us nearer to you, helping us grow in confidence and trust. Thank you, God, for your word this morning. We pray that as Pastor Ken preaches and opens the scriptures to us, God, you would speak to our hearts. And again, Lord, our prayer is that your word would not uh, return to you void, but it would accomplish the purpose for which it is sent out today. Bring about a harvest of righteousness through us, God. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome, uh, New Branch. Um, it's great to be able to uh, spend this time with you again. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, uh, please turn in them this morning to Genesis chapter 28. As you're turning to Genesis 28 this morning, um, I want to share with you what our plans are, Lord willing. Um, you have been incredibly uh, patient and gracious as we have sought to be as wise and as careful as possible uh, while longing to gather together again uh, one day. Um, it is our intention, our plan, to um, attempt to have a physical gathering again on May 31st. So not this next Sunday, 
Uh, but Lord willing, the following Sunday, we will gather again. We've got a plan. Uh, we've got a team of folks who have been working on this plan and putting all of the elements in place in order for us to be ready to gather again in our building. And we are excited uh, to be able to try this. So um, that's our plan as of today. Uh, we will continue to let you know uh, and firm that up um, as we get closer to the 31st. Um, tomorrow on Monday, you should be receiving in your email um, what our plan actually looks like and uh, what we're going to be doing as far as seating in this room, um, having some overflow downstairs, how we're going to be handling restrooms and all of that sort of thing. And so we're going to lay out that as clearly, as succinctly as we can. Uh, but if you have any questions um, about things that aren't covered in that communication, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get with us and ask us what those questions are. We're also going to ask you to, uh, in a sense, RSVP. We want to hear from you uh, what your intention is. We know things always come up. Uh, but in order for us to plan as best as we can, we'd like to know if your family is going to be joining us on the 31st, and if so, how many in your family will be attending. And so uh, please join us in praying uh, that we would, in fact, be able to do that, that all of the pieces uh, that still yet uh, need to be done will fall into place, and that we will be able to gather together. We know not everyone uh, will be able to. Uh, we know that those who are in the uh, the elderly bracket, which uh, our state says 65 and older, uh, really should not uh, be attending physically these kinds of gatherings yet. And so we're going to continue to limit that they can't join us. Those who, for health reasons, um, they should not be joining us as well. And so we know it won't be um, back to the way it was quite yet. But at least we'll be able to have a physical gathering again by God's grace. And so please join us in continuing to pray that that would, in fact, be the case. So this morning we are in Genesis chapter 28, having taken uh, one week off for Mother's Day. We're back into the narrative of Genesis. And in chapter 28, we're going to encounter the story of Jacob's ladder. It may be a familiar story to many of you, but... Through this story, church, we're going to be reminded of the very good news that God has granted us access to him through Jesus Christ. And that through this access, we can be rescued from our sin and that we can be saved from the judgment that we deserve. But even more than that, that through this access that we now have to God through Jesus Christ, that we can know that whatever condition and whatever circumstances we find ourselves in life, that he, the Lord our God, is with us. And that's the good news that we'll hear from Genesis chapter 28. So follow along in your copy of the scriptures as we read the entire chapter and we'll focus on the dream of Jacob found in verses 10 through 15. This is the word of God. Then, Jacob called, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him, You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, 
because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Let's pray. Our God and King, we thank you for... The honor and the privilege of worshiping you this morning, though we are not gathered physically here, we are gathered in spirit and we're gathered digitally in our homes, uniting together under the gospel, uniting in worship of you. And Father, now we turn to your word and we ask, Father, that you would speak to us from it. We pray, Father, that you would speak through me. I I pray, Father, for your anointing on me as I seek to unpack this passage of Scripture. Not for my sake and not ultimately for our sake, but for your name's sake. Give me an anointing so that I may stay true to your word and that your people may be encouraged by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Genesis chapter 28 Uh, can broadly be divided up into three sections. The first nine verses of chapter 28 are really the aftermath of that story in chapter 27 where we saw the, the deception by Jacob of becoming masquerading as his brother Esau and, and trying to steal his blessing. And, and so those first nine verses are really the aftermath of what happened after that. And verses 10 through 15 are... Uh, dealing with Jacob's actual dream. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time there, seeking to understand what that dream means and interpret that. And then the closing verses in verses 16 through 22 deal with Jacob's response after waking up from that dream. So let's, let's deal with the first nine verses first. And there are three things that are happening in those opening verses. Number one, Isaac blesses his son Jacob. Secondly, Isaac sends his son Jacob away to Paddan Aram to find a wife. And then thirdly, Esau, the other twin brother, the, the, the other son of Isaac, he marries a daughter of Ishmael. So we're going to look at each, three, each of these um, briefly. And in each of these characters in the story, we're going to be able to draw out a principle that we can apply to our lives. And so first, let's look at the the blessing of Isaac on Jacob that we see in the first five verses. Now, we know that Isaac has already blessed Jacob. We saw that back in chapter 27 when Jacob dressed up as his hairy brother Esau and, and in essence, stole the blessing from his brother, and it worked. And as a result, Isaac blessed Jacob. But as you'll recall from our study of chapter 27, it was actually Jacob's blessing to begin with. It started out with Esau, because Esau was the firstborn. Um, Remember, um, Jacob was the heel grabber who came next out of the womb. 
Esau, as the firstborn, he had the birthright. And also he had the, the blessing, he was owed the blessing of the firstborn son. And so uh, they, they at first belonged to Esau because he was the firstborn. But we remember in the story early on that Esau uh, at one point was, uh, was hungry and uh, out of his hunger, out of his fleshly desire, he sold his birthright to his twin brother Jacob for a bowl of soup that Jacob had prepared. And so then the birthright became Jacob's by right because he had purchased it with a bowl of soup. But not only was the birthright now Jacob's, but because the, to, the, the birthright belongs to the firstborn and now Jacob has that, the blessing of the firstborn also belongs to Jacob. And so now it's transferred from Esau to Jacob. And then we have the story of chapter 27 where the father Isaac uh, tries to give the blessing of the firstborn son to Esau. And, and he did that um, knowing that God had prophesied to his wife Rebekah that the older will serve the younger. Remember uh, back in chapter um, 24, I believe it was, when uh, God revealed to Rebekah that she was pregnant with twins, that she was going to give birth to twins. God prophesied to her that the older will serve the younger. The firstborn will be subservient to the secondborn. And so even though um, Isaac knows this, he tries in chapter 27 to now give the, the, uh, the blessing of the firstborn to Esau. And he does this out of a hunger for some venison or whatever it was that Esau was going to prepare. And so he tells Esau, go and kill some game and prepare food for me. But Rebecca overhears that the trickery of Isaac. And so she comes up with her own deceptive plan to dress up Jacob in the, a, a hairy costume and masquerade him as uh, their son Esau, who was hairy. And lo and behold, it works. And they trick Isaac. And Isaac gives the blessing to Jacob. So now we have chapter 28 where Isaac is blessing Jacob again. And I think what's happening here is that Isaac now realizes the wrong that he had done in trying to wrongfully uh, contravene what he knew to be God's will and give the blessing to Esau instead of to Jacob. He knew about the prophecy. He knew that he was contravening God's decree simply because he wanted some of Esau's venison. And so I think part of what we see in these first five verses is um, Isaac now doing what he knows to be right and blessing his son Jacob now in a genuine way. Before it was out of deception, but now he's blessing his son Jacob knowing out of kind of a, a repentance, coming to terms with the fact that he had done the wrong thing in trying to give it to Esau instead of to Jacob who rightly deserved it. And so he now genuinely and heartfeltly gives this blessing to Jacob. And he recognizes that uh, the promises that God made to his father, Abraham, the promises that then were subsequently handed down to him as Abraham's son, that God intends for those blessings and those promises to now be extended through the line of his son, Jacob, not Esau, and so he gives them to him. And so he mentions the blessing of Abraham in verse 4. The blessing of Abraham were the promises of land, the promises of offspring, and the promises that, that through you and through your offspring all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And he mentions the blessing of Abraham as a prayer. He says in verse 4, May he, the Lord that is, may he give you the blessing of Abraham. So Isaac prays and, and, and asks that God would in fact extend these promises that he gave to Abraham and to himself now to his son Jacob. And these are the prayers that we see God answering later in the chapter in Jacob's dream. The second thing that's happening in these first five verses is that Isaac is sending Jacob back to Haran to find a wife there. He says, he says, do not take a Canaanite for your wife. The Canaanites were uh, worshipers of false gods. And so um, he doesn't want him to take a Canaanite wife. And so he sends Jacob back to his homeland 
to get a wife from there, which parallels very closely the story of Abraham when he sends his servant back to Haran to find a wife for Isaac. We now see that playing out in uh, Jacob's life. And then briefly in verses 6 through 9, we get this brief look at Esau, the other twin. He sees his father, bless Jacob again, which you know has got to be just pouring salt in the wound for Esau. And he hears his father warn his brother not to marry a Canaanite woman. And so what does Esau do? Bearing in mind that he already has two Canaanite wives. And so now hearing that that's not pleasing to his father, what does he do? Well, now he goes out and he marries a daughter of Ishmael, the one who Bible scholars believe is the father of the Arab nations, uh, the Arab nations that would be one day fierce enemies of the nation of Israel. And so what we have here is a, is a picture of an unbeliever in Esau. He's the picture of an unbeliever who continues to go his own way and do his own thing, following the desire of his own heart, and all the while storing up wrath for the day of judgment, digging with each step that he takes, digging his hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And he does things out of two motives that we see here. Number one, a desperate desire to please his father. A desperate desire for the blessing of his father, which he seemingly never gets. But secondly and more poignantly, out of a raging hatred for his brother. We saw at the end of chapter 27 that Esau, as a result of his brother stealing a blessing from him that his father intended to give him in that setting, that Esau vows to murder his twin brother Jacob. And so this is a hatred that doesn't go away. This is a hatred that lasts a lifetime and one that we will continue to see boil up in the ensuing chapters in this Genesis narrative. And so we see these three characters in the first nine verses. And from each of their lives, we learn a lesson. First of all, we see Isaac. Isaac is the dad who recognizes that he has messed up royally with his sons. And then he decides to make his wrongs right. He decides to do the right thing and bless Jacob, which he knew is what God intended from the beginning. And so we learn from him that we're reminded that it's never too late to do the right thing. That's what we learn from Isaac. It's never too late to do the right thing, no matter how bad we've messed up. That's a lesson from his life. And then we see Esau. Esau is the unbeliever who is blinded by rage, blinded by hatred, and desperate to please his father. And out of those motives, he makes one bonehead decision after another. And so from him, we learn not to be ruled by our anger and our desire to please others. We're reminded that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And that giving full vent to our anger, Proverbs says, makes us a fool, which is what we see in Esau. And then we also see Jacob in these opening nine verses. He's on the run from his brother Esau, running away from his anger. Remember, he's not just going to pat an aram because his father told him to. We, we're, we recall that his mother, Rebecca, actually engineered this plan. Um, and out of a desire to see her son, Jacob, uh, freed from and escape from the, the revengeful wrath of Esau, she comes up with, with this plan to send him away and flee to Laban, her brother in Haran. And so Jacob's on the run. He's on the run from his brother's wrath, um, and he's following the direction of his father and his mother. And we note here that he's not, he's not making these decisions on his own. Again, we see Jacob as kind of a, a, a passive guy in this, in this case. He's certainly not listening to the Lord. If anything, he's kind of ambivalent towards God as he sets out on this journey towards Paddan Aram to find a wife. So he's alone, and he's tired, and he's weary. And that's where we pick up the story of Jacob's dream that we want to spend the bulk of our time on this morning in verses 10 through 22. So this is the story of Jacob's ladder. And you may have heard of it before. Actually, it's the story of Jacob's dream about a ladder. 
And so he's tired on, and, and weary on this trip, and so he stops on his way from Beersheba to Paddan Aram, and he goes to sleep. And he takes a rock, and he uses a rock as a pillow. So you, you know that you're tired when you can use a rock as a pillow. And so that's what he does. He goes to sleep, and he has this dream. And he dreams about a ladder. And the ladder starts down in earth and it extends all the way up to heaven. And on that ladder there are angels ascending and descending. And he sees the Lord at the top of the ladder. And the Lord speaks to Jacob in his dream. What does the Lord say? Well, he reiterates the very same covenant promises that he had given to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and his father, Isaac, now God gives these promises, covenant promises, to Jacob. We see they're fourfold here. First of all, they are a promise of land. At the end of verse 13, the Lord says, And the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Secondly, is the promise of offspring, and not just offspring, but numerous, many offspring, the opening uh, lines of verse 14 say, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. Just like the promises to Abraham and to Isaac that your offspring will be numerous. So he makes the same promises to Jacob. Thirdly, it's the promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. The end of verse 14 says, And in you... And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Again, mirroring the promises to Abraham and Isaac. And then fourthly, it's the promise of God's presence. And this, was, this is what's so important for our understanding of Jacob's ladder here. It's the promise of God's blessing and the promise of God's presence to be with Jacob all of his days. Until these promises are fulfilled. Look at verse 15. He says, Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. These are the same promises that we see God giving to Abraham and then to Isaac, and now he's giving them to Jacob. And this is, a, this is an answer to Isaac's prayer that he prayed in the first part of the chapter when he prayed, God, would you give the blessing of Abraham to my son Jacob? God is now answer, answering that prayer. And the fact that these promises that were given to Abraham and Isaac are now given to Jacob is indication to us that the redemptive plan of God that was in place from the very beginning the, the redemptive plan of God that he would bring a rescuer through the seed of the woman who would one day crush the head of the serpent, bringing an end to the curse of, of sin and death, that that redemptive plan of God was still in place. That it didn't end with the, with the sin of the patriarchs. It didn't end with their lack of faith. It didn't end with the infertility of their wives that that redemptive plan of God to bring a rescuer through the line of Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob was still in place. God was still working out his redemptive plan and that now it was going to come through the line and seed of Jacob. And so that's the, that's the dream. And, and then Jacob wakes up from this dream and he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And he recognizes that God is with him and he takes the stone pillow and he, he turns it into a stone pillar and he erects this mini altar and he worships God there and he calls the place Bethel, which means the house of God. So how are we to understand Jacob's dream? What is the meaning of the ladder in his dream? What is the meaning of these angels that are ascending and descending from heaven to earth and earth to heaven? And how do we mesh that with these promises that are now given to Jacob? Well, this passage of scripture is a very good example for us for how when we are seeking to interpret scripture that we need to let the Bible interpret the Bible. 
You see, when we ask the question, questions like, what is the meaning of the latter in this story? We, we need to remember that, that ultimately the answer to that question can't be something that comes from you and I. We're to draw meaning out from this text, not to bring meaning into this text. You see, it's not about one person saying, well, to me, to me, the latter is like steps on our spiritual journey with God and, and, and that we just have to take one rung of the ladder at a time. And then another person says, yeah, but, but to me, the ladder is kind of symbolic of climbing out of hard times in our life. And so when we're tired and we're weary and when we're afraid like Jacob was, we just need the Lord to give us a spiritual ladder. And then, of course, the fireman says, well, I know ladders and ladders help me bring the water to, to fires. And so to me, this is saying that when we've got fires that are raging in our lives, that God gives us a means by which we can put those fires out. So are any of these folks right in their interpretation? Are all of them right in their interpretation? See, we don't bring meaning to the text. We, we dig and we dig and we dig in the text, knowing and believing that the meaning is in there. We don't bring the meaning to the text. We dig until we find the meaning that is already there. So just as with any kind of digging that you would do, there are tools that we can use when we dig. And so by way of seeking to interpret this text, I want to talk about four of those tools that we can use when mining Scripture to understand the meaning that is there. And by way of that, I think we'll arrive at the interpretation, the right meaning of Jacob's ladder and Jacob's dream. And it is glorious. The first digging tool that we should use when mining for the meaning in Scripture is to consider context, to consider what's going on in, in the context of the story. Don't just pull a verse out of Scripture and say, I think this is what that means. We need to understand how that verse, how that passage fits within the broader place in Scripture. And so we remember what's happening here in the context of this story. Jacob is traveling from Beersheba to Paddan Aram. He was in Bathsheba with his family, with his mom and dad, and he's going to Paddan Aram to find a wife, and now he's on his own. He's traveling to this place that he's never been. It's, it's, it's maybe uh, the, the place of her, his, his mother's um, homeland and, and his grandfather's homeland, but he had never been there before. It was an unknown, unknown land. He had never been on this journey before. This is the first that we know of him even being alone ever before. And so he's alone, perhaps for the first time in his life, he's on this long journey. And we should remind ourselves here that this was not a spiritual journey for him. At least he didn't set out with that motive. He didn't set out trying to find God. In fact, he wasn't trying to find God at all. He was asleep. He was just obeying mom and dad by going to Haran to find a wife. But even though he's not looking for God, God finds him. He's, a, he's asleep by himself. He's not searching for God. He's not seeking for God in the least. And yet, God finds him. God comes to him. And the Lord shows up to him in a dream and reminds him of his promises and reminds him of his presence. That he would fulfill his covenant promises to him and that he would always be present with Jacob. And God does this for Jacob by way of this dream of a ladder with angels ascending the ladder and descending the ladder, going up to heaven and coming back down to earth. And so based on the context, we see that the ladder represents access to God's presence for Jacob. And this access comes to Jacob, notwithstanding the complete lack of any searching for it or any searching for God on Jacob's part. It comes to him, this access to God, it comes to him just the same. A second digging tool that we can use when mining scripture for meaning is to consider the author of the text. Now we know that God is the author of all of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, we quote it often. All scripture is inspired by God. That means breathed out by God, is the breath of God. 
All scripture is inspired by God. And so God is the author of all of scripture, but God uses human authors to put his inspired words on paper so that we can read them. And many times it's helpful for us to consider the human author that God uses and his life and his experience and what was going on in his life that helps us to understand the meaning of the text. So obviously the human author of Genesis was Moses. So how do you think Moses would have reacted to this story as the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write these words down about Jacob's dream as he lays down on this rock pillow? How do you think Moses, the the human author, would have responded and reacted to this story about God giving Jacob a symbol of his presence with him? Well, I, I like to think that as Moses is writing down these words, that he's thinking back to a very similar experience in his life that happened many, many years before he wrote this. It's a story from Exodus chapter 3, a time when God showed up to him in a symbol, a burning bush that wasn't consumed by the fire. And that in that setting, through that burning bush, the Lord told Moses that he would be sending him back to Egypt to free his people out of slavery. Listen to that story from Exodus chapter 3. God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and he said this, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look look at God. Much the same as Jacob's fear that we see in this Genesis 28 story. He's afraid after this dream. Verse 7, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. Look at verse 8, and I have come down. Almost the imagery of descending a ladder. The Lord God says to Moses, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, come. Come, Moses, I will send you to the Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And then listen to the Lord's response in verse 12. He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this very mountain. I think that Moses, now many, many years later, as he's writing these inspired words from the Spirit about Jacob's dream, about this ladder and access granted to God, and the reminder that God would be with Jacob, that Moses is thinking back to this experience and the promise that God gave him that when he sent him out on this task to free his children out of slavery in Egypt, that God would be with him every step of the way, as he promises to be with Jacob. A third tool that we can use when digging for meaning in Scripture is to consider the original audience. Who was the audience of the original manuscript, and how would they have handled the text? What what was the meaning to them? So the original audience for this text obviously would have been the Israelites wandering in the Sinai Peninsula. The Slavery in Egypt behind them and and the promised land ahead of them. This is the audience to which Moses originally wrote the book of Genesis. So how would they have understood and applied this dream of Jacob's to their condition? How would they have understood this dream? Or more importantly, um, what was Moses' purpose and intent in writing about this dream for them? Well, consider their plight in the wilderness. It wasn't called wilderness wanderings for no reason. For 40 years, literally a generation, this nation, these people wandered the Sinai Peninsula, looking and waiting for the promised land. And then they read this story about their namesake, Jacob. We recall in Genesis 35, many chapters later, Jacob, his name will be changed by the Lord God from Jacob to Israel. 
And so he is their namesake. And so they would read, as they're wandering the wilderness, they would read this story about their namesake, Jacob, who was reminded that God would be with him every step of the way, and not just with him, but with the nation that would come after him, which is Israel. And they would be encouraged. And so for them, the, J- Jacob's ladder would have been an incredible encouragement to them as they are wandering the Sinai Peninsula. That even in their rebellion against God, even in their complaining about how bad they had it out in the desert, even then, God was with them. He had promised to be with them. And he promised to guide them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And we're told in Exodus chapter 13, verse 22, that this pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the Lord. It was always with them, always reminding them that Yahweh was with them as they traveled. Later, as these people stood on the banks of the Jordan River, about to cross into the promised land, where there were giants and fortified cities, how did Joshua encourage them? Or or how did God encourage Joshua to lead the nation across the Jordan and into that land? He encouraged them this way, Joshua 1, verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Why? Because they're strong? No. He says, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So be strong and courageous. Then he, then he told him in verse 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So the Lord encouraged Joshua. And through these words, Joshua encouraged the nation that God would be with them as they continued to be faithful and obedient to him. Even much later, as the Israelites find themselves in exile, having been defeated by the Babylonian Empire, the Lord says to them in Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you in exile. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How and why? Because I am with you, Israel. Two chapters later, Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You see, over and over and over and over again, the Israelites, no matter what condition they found themselves in, whether it was slavery or desert wanderings or wartime or peacetime or Um, exile or whatever it was God was continually reminding them that he was with them and he wouldn't leave them and so he reminds us parenthetically another thing that would have come into the minds of the Israelites what they would have recalled when they heard this story about a ladder that stretched from earth to heaven they would have recalled the story that we covered back in Uh, Genesis chapter 11, about the Tower of Babel. You probably recall that story, this Tower of Babel, where the people kind of banded together in their prideful arrogance. They thought they could build a tower up to the heavens. The the Tower of Babel was an attempt by these prideful people to to build a a tower and reach the heavens and, and gain access to the power of God and the presence of God. The Israelites would have recognized that the ladder in Jacob's dream was, was kind of like that tower. It stretched from earth to heaven. But the difference was this ladder was put there by God, whereas the tower was put there by man. And the angels who were descending and ascending this ladder were angels of God. So while the Tower of Babel was an unsuccessful attempt by man to gain access to God, Jacob's ladder in his dream was an effort by God to come down to man. And so that's what the ladder is to Jacob. It is a sign that that God will be with him and would never leave him. 
That even when Jacob isn't looking for God, that God would find him. And even when, when Jacob is asleep, that God would be with him. And in the fullness of, of time, according to God's goodness and divine sovereign plan, God ultimately comes to be with his people through his son, Jesus Christ, who we know is called Emmanuel, God with us. And after he finished his work on the cross that he came to do, he promises his disciples at the end of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 20, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then he sends his spirit to us, his Holy Spirit. He sends his Holy Spirit to be with us until he returns to be with us forever in paradise. And so Jacob's ladder is it's actually pointing us to Jesus. He, Jesus, is the means by which we have access to God. And in John's gospel, Jesus tells us that of himself. In John's gospel, Jesus references this story of Jacob's dream about this ladder. And he says, in essence, that's me. That he is the fulfillment of this dream. And so now we have got the fourth tool for, for digging for meaning in Scripture. And that is that we must allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's what Jesus does. In the context of John chapter 1, Jesus is calling his disciples to himself. And he calls Philip. And Philip gets excited about meeting Jesus. And so he calls his friend Nathaniel. And, and, and when Jesus reveal, reveals himself to Nathanael, he says to Nathanael, Nathanael, I saw you when you were sitting under that fig tree just now. I saw you in my mind. I, I knew it was you. I knew where you were. You were under that fig tree. And, and Nathanael says, this must be the Son of God. Listen to how Jesus responds to Nathanael. In John 1, verses 50 through 51, Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's a direct reference to Jacob's dream here in Genesis chapter 28. Jesus was pointing Nathaniel to the salvation that he would procure for sinful man in just three short years on earth. And he says, in essence, I will purchase access to the Father through my sacrificial death on the cross. Jesus is saying to him, I am Jacob's ladder. As Peter said in Acts 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only in the name of Jesus, the Lord our God. As Jesus says of himself in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying here, I am Jacob's ladder. And look at how we see the sovereign grace of God in this. Jacob, as we've said before, he was not searching for God. He was not looking for God. He was, he was indifferent, ambivalent towards God. He was a cheat. He was a supplanter, a, a, a heel grabber, fresh on the heels, no pun intended, of his latest coup, stealing the blessing from his twin brother by deceiving his father. What a wretch this Jacob is. And yet God opens up heaven in this dream and provides access to the least worthy sinner. And friend, isn't that what the Lord has done for us? It's what he's done for me. Christ has purchased my access to the Father. To me, the chief of sinners, he has purchased access to God. Jonathan Edwards, the great theologian and leader of the great American great uh, awakening in the United States in the 18th century. 
he preached on Genesis chapter 28. And he even went a bit further in talking about how Jacob's dream points to Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. For, for him, um, it wasn't the ladder that was Christ. It was the pillow, the rock pillow, the rock on which Jacob laid his head. Listen to how Edwards explains this. Jacob's sleeping or resting on this stone is a type of faith by which believers are resting on Christ. Christ invites the weary to come to him and his promises. Jacob, while resting on this stone, has heaven's gates open to him and a ladder reaching from heaven to God. So tis by faith in Christ, whereby the believers rest on Christ, that they have heaven's gate open to them and have a ladder or a way procured for them to ascend and come to God in heaven. Jacob, while resting on the stone, had God appearing to him as his covenant God. So tis through faith in Christ that God becomes the covenant God of his people. Well, whether Jesus is the stone pillow or whether he is Jacob's ladder, it is clear that the story here reminds us that if sinful mankind is going to have access to God, it is not going to be by man's effort. That God must come to man. That he must make a way or else sinful man is without hope. And God has made a way. He's made a way through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the stone pillow on, much, on which we must rest, on which we must rely if we were to have access to a holy God. He is the ladder that must come down to us so that we may have access to God and access to our home through faith. So how do we respond to this? Well, if, if you're an unbeliever, someone who has not professed faith in Jesus Christ as your one and only hope to be rescued from the judgment that you and I and everyone deserves because of our sin and rebellion against God. If you've not trusted in Christ to be rescued from that, if you've not trusted in his finished work on the cross as your only hope, then your response to this must be repentance and faith. If God has made this, this truth real to you and you long to be reconciled to God, if you long to have the presence of God in your life, in this life and in the next, then your response is to repent, to turn away from your sin and your desire to rule and lead your own life and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and trust in him as your Lord, trust in him as your leader, your rescuer, your redeemer. And he will give you new life in Christ. He will forgive you of your sins and he will grant you access to God through faith. For that is what he purchased on Calvary. But if you are a believer and you have trusted in God, what is your response to this? What is our response to Jacob's dream? I think our response should, uh, in much the same way, be similar to Jacob's response when he woke up from this dream. In verses 16 through 22, we see four responses from Jacob. First of all, he recognized the presence of God in his life. Look at verses 16 and 17. Jacob awoke from his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. I wasn't aware of it. I didn't recognize it. Verse 17, and he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Friend, maybe you start here by just recognizing the presence of God in your life. In good times and in bad, when you're doing well spiritually and when you're not, when you are genuinely happy and when you are genuinely depressed, when you're walking in victory and when you're walking in sin, that he is with you. And that even in a quarantine, when our life has turned all, all the way around and backwards, that the Lord our God who promised to be with you is still with you. And he's never left your side. 
So maybe you begin there. But then in recognizing the very presence of God, you do what Jacob does next, which is to worship God. Having recognized God's presence and God's goodness and God's providential care for him, he took that stone pillow and he turned it into a stone pillar. And he erected a mini altar and he poured oil on it and he worshiped God there. And he called that place Bethel, Bethel, which means house of God. And this became a very, very special place for Jacob, a place to which he would return and one day live and worship and build a real altar there where he would be reminded that God was always with him in the good times and in the bad. In fact, listen to what God says to Jacob many years later in Genesis chapter 35. God said to Jacob, now an old man, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, live there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So he tells him to recall this scene. Verse 2, so Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, put away your foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and, and change your garments. In other words, get ready, family, we're going to church. Get ready, prepare yourself. We're, we're going to go worship the Lord. In verse 3, Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. Brother, sister, do you have a Bethel? A place where you go to be reminded of God's presence. Maybe it's a physical place. Maybe it's just a, a place on your calendar or, or a place in your to-do list. But it's a place in your heart, in your mind, in your soul where you go to be reminded that God is with you. Where you have an erected a, an altar to God in your heart and soul and mind and where you worship God. Friend, the only appropriate response to our recognition of the presence of God in our lives is heartfelt, genuine, Bible-saturated, Holy Spirit-guided worship. Yes, I know that all of life is worship, but friend, you and I need a Bethel that we return to that will remind us of the presence of God in our lives and that He has granted us access to this presence through the sacrificial death of His Son, Jesus Christ. So let us go to Bethel, church, and worship. The third thing that Jacob does here is he makes a vow to God. So these these last two things that Jacob does really are two forms of his worship. And the first is that he makes a vow to God. Look at verses 20 and 21. Then Jacob made a vow to God saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Now, when we read Jacob's view, it appears to be conditional. And it appears that way because it is. He says, if you will do this for me, then you will be my God. And we know that that isn't right. We know that Scripture frowns very heavily on any kind of conditional vow before God. These are not the kinds of vows that we should be making to God. God, if you'll just help me out of this pickle, if you'll just give me a job, if you'll just bring me the healing that I need, if you'll just give me the thing that I really want, If you'll do this for me, then I will follow you and serve you. That's not honoring to God. That's not what God is looking for. But I think we should probably cut Jacob a little bit of slack here. Because he's just now getting to know the Lord. He's very, very young in his faith. He hasn't been discipled. He hasn't been mentored. And in fact, this is the very first vow that's ever recorded in Scripture. And so he has no way of knowing that he shouldn't do this. But the point here is that it's perfectly appropriate. It's perfectly appropriate for us to make a vow to God in response for his providential presence in our lives. And we don't, we don't enter into vows lightly or rashly as, as the word gives us guidance to do, to do so. But we make vows when we ordain elders. We recite vows in our marriage ceremonies like Trent and Rachel did yesterday. And it is perfectly, perfectly appropriate for us to make vows to God in our worship. Vows like, Lord, by your grace, by your grace, I commit this day to you. Lord, 
according to your divine and gracious assistance in my life. I, I vow to live for your glory this week or this month. These are very appropriate means of expressing our worship to God. And then fourthly and finally, Jacob sacrificially gives to the Lord. Verse 22 says, And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. The giving of a tenth should remind us of the story of his grandfather Abraham when he gave a tenth of all that he had to the priest king Melchizedek in chapter 14. But when we're reminded of the sovereign an inescapable and irresistible grace of God that looks down on sinners like you and I and grants us access to him through the sacrificial death of his sinless and spotless lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good and right and perfectly natural for us to sacrificially give back to the Lord whether it's sacrificially giving of our resources or our time or our gifts or whatever it is, we recognize that whatever we have is his anyway. And we give back to him, not, by, not, not as a means or an attempt to pay him back because we never could, but as a way of expressing our worship and a way of expressing our thanks to him for what he has done for a sinner like me. And so Christian, let me exhort you, recognize where you are in your place in life, no matter what the condition of your heart is, if you are a believer in Christ, the Lord your God is with you. Right there where you are, God is with you. Recognize that and then respond to that in worship. And if he so leads you, express that worship through vows and sacrificial giving. And in so doing, may the name of our gracious and glorious God be magnified and glorified in us, among us, and through us. Would you pray with me? Our gracious God and King, who are we that you would consider us? Much less that you would condescend yourself to put on flesh and become one of us and live a perfectly righteous life achieving righteousness and justification for us and dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that by faith in Jesus we might be granted access to the Holy of Holies, your presence that not only rescues us for eternity and secures a home for us with you, but allows us to experience your presence in our life today and tomorrow. Regardless of our spiritual condition, regardless of how obedient we are to you, regardless of how unhappy circumstances might become, regardless of how difficult things may get, Regardless of viruses or job loss or cancer or disease or whatever, that you are with us. And so, God, we thank you and we praise you and we honor you and we glorify you as the one who is present with us in every circumstance of life. Father, may you receive our worship as we seek to live for you as an expression of worship and thanks until we are reunited with you face to face again. For that, we look forward to it and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Well, church, as we conclude our time together this morning, we have several announcements. Uh, first of all, if you are a guest with us, uh, we are so glad that you joined us this morning, and we would love to connect with you. And uh, we would just ask that you would go to newbranch.com slash connect and fill out our digital connect card so that we can get to know you and uh, follow up with you this morning. Secondly, if you would like to give, uh, because we are not able to physically gather right now, we are asking uh, everybody to mail their checks to our P.O. Box. It's P.O. Box 265 in Decula. Uh, you can also give online if you prefer that option. 
I also want to uh, make sure that uh, everybody's aware of, of these two uh, church-wide Zoom calls that we have each week. Uh, first of all, on Wednesdays at noon, we have uh, Pastor Connect. Uh, pa- Pastor Ken will uh, give a pr- brief devotional, and uh, we'll spend some time praying together and just time for us to catch up. Uh, so we have that on Wednesdays at noon. And then we also have our corporate prayer time uh, led by Pastor Matt uh, at 4 o'clock on Friday. So we would encourage you just to, to plug into those Zoom calls on Wednesday and on Friday. And then we also have a, uh, a men's devotional on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, so men, if you're looking for an opportunity to, to connect uh, during the week, uh, we would just encourage you to jump on that call uh, as uh, one of the men of the church offers a brief devotional and spends some time in prayer together. Uh, we're also excited to announce that we, we have two summer interns uh, this, uh, this summer. Nathan Dolan and Nathan Reichert are going to be interning with New Branch uh, this, throughout this summer. And so they're going to be uh, intentionally discipled this summer. There's going to be opportunities for ministry experience and uh, leadership development, all within the context of gospel community. And so, church, we just want to ask you to be praying for those young men, that God would mature them and equip them as they serve the church this summer. And then lastly, we have our newsletter that we send out each uh, Friday. Uh, So if you're not signed up for that and you'd like to to know what's going on in the church, just go to newbranch.com slash newsletter in order to sign up for that. Well, as we conclude our time together this morning, church, I just want to read from Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. This is Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And may this be our prayer for one another this week. And so from the day we heard, We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins.